Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for Queen's Free Speaking of Health monthly lecture series. Tonight's lecture is called Hormonal Changes with Aging, What is Happening to My Body? I'm sure for a lot of you, that's what's happening. That's what you're thinking, right? So this is the time where you're going to find out the answers to that. My name is Lisa Sakia. I'm with Corporate Communications here at the Queen's Health Systems. On behalf of Queen's, I welcome you all this evening. And now, it is my privilege and honor to introduce you to our main speaker this evening, Dr. Alan Parsa. We can have him stand. He is an endocrinologist and he is the medical director for the diabetes program at the Queen's Medical Center at West Oahu. He grew up right here on Oahu and attended what I think is probably the best school in the state. I think it's the best school in the nation, yeah. It's uh, also the school I happen to have gone to, Mid-Pacific Institute, Go Owls. He then went to the University of San Diego and uh, then St. George's University uh, School of Medicine. Upon completing his residency training at Seton Hall University in New Jersey, he completed a fellowship in adrenal steroid disorders at Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. This was followed by an endocrinology fellowship at the Cedars Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. You really got around. <laughs> yeah, coastal, by coastal. Dr. Parsa is double board certified in internal medicine and endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism. He is a member of the Endocrine Society, American Thyroid Association, and the American Association of Clinical Endocrinologists. He has special interests in adrenal, thyroid, and pituitary disorders, as well as comprehensive diabetes care. And in his free time, he is an avid surfer, and he enjoys anything outdoors. Please welcome Dr. Parsa. Okay. Um, you guys are welcome to give me those $5 for the retirement fund, too. I don't mind. Um, okay, so we are going to be talking about hormones and changes. So that encompasses two real things. Um, it's going to be menopause for the women and andropause, which is a term that we don't really use too much in endocrinology, but it's a term that we hear thrown around um, here and there. So we're going to start off with menopause first, and then we're going to slowly work our way into andropause and kind of talk about the changes and what can happen with these um, with these conditions. So starting off in menopause, we hear a lot of things about the changes that can that are to come. So what are these changes and what can we do about it? Well one thing we don't know about menopause or a lot of people don't think about it is that it comes in three phases. It's not just menopause in itself. We have this perimenopausal component of it. We have the actual menopause and then we have postmenopause. And we don't, we usually talk about just the one component, but if, as you'll see, there, it, by having three, com three phases of it, it really stretches the whole thing out, and it's not just a short time frame that, that the changes happen, but it's over a long time period. So what are the, uh, what time periods become, so what is perimenopausal period? So the perimenopausal phase is a time when your periods start becoming a little bit less regular. They become a little bit more unpredictable. So a lot of times people, you know, maybe it'll be once every other month your periods will happen. Potentially maybe you'll spot a little bit more during one, uh, one month versus another. The, sometimes maybe the periods may be longer or shorter. There's no real, there's, it, it, you see a change. Um, the change itself can vary from woman to woman, and that's what makes it a little bit harder for us to start determining, well, is this when it's starting, or when did it actually start? The other thing that happens is the ovaries start beginning to produce less and less estrogen. By producing less estrogen, also fewer eggs are released from the ovaries. And so this is a whole thing that where everything starts, and it slowly progresses from this further and further along. So when does it actually start? Um, 40 years old is pretty much the earliest we say that the perimenopausal phase begins. If you start having these types of symptoms before that, it is not normal, it's considered abnormal, and we need to do some other work up to see why is it happening before the age of 40. But otherwise, 40 years old is typically when we see it start, and it progresses on through uh, 
through into your 50s, and it can go even longer depending on uh, some people. Some people, we hear about people having babies in the mid-50s, late-50s. Uh, so it doesn't end until you have your last period. Once that last period happens, that perimenopausal period is now over. And average age in the U.S. is around 52 years old. So we say 52-year-old. That's why we usually tell people, you know, 51, 52, that's when menopause begins. But that's maybe when menopause begins, but that's not when perimenopause happens. And perimenopause is not just um, the decrease of the estrogens. It's not just a changing the periods. But also you start noticing the different symptoms that go along with the decrease in estrogens. So what are these symptoms? We get the hot flashes start happening at, during this time. They may, be, they may not be very frequent, but they occur. You might have increased fatigues, the periods we talked about, some breast tenderness, mood swings start occurring. Some people start having uh, trouble sleeping. And if you look at some of, these, some of this picture over here, it's, it's some of these are similar to things that we see with thyroid dysfunction. So a lot of people go and they start having this fatigue, these hot flashes, and, they, and these peri irregular periods, and they say, my thyroid is, something is wrong with my thyroid. And a lot of times people start blaming the thyroid, and they start going online, and there's a lot of literature online talking about, you know, the thyroid, your thyroid, your thyroid. So it's important, and this is also, since this happens in our 40s, it also can happen, thyroid also seems to occur in 40s in, the, in a lot of women also. So there's, there's, this, there's this crossover that can happen, and because of that, I think menopause is, very, is missed very frequently because they're so focused that it could be a thyroid, and also there's a big push right now about thyroid being an in thing that we miss the menopause phase of things, and we start looking at something that we're, and we're completely missing where things are actually happening. So this is, these are some of the symptoms to be aware of, and the symptoms can progress. They may be very mild early on, and they may be progressing get worse and worse over time. Um, so what is menopause? Menopause is the next phase that we talked about, and uh, this is where we go from Periods becoming less and less frequent to no periods at all. So the definition of menopause, once you have your last period, that's when perimenopause ends, menopause begins. Menopause is completed after one full year, 12 months without any periods. If you have spotting in between, technically you're not menopausing. You're actually still in that perimenopause phase, even though it's just small amounts of blood that may be uh, seen, it's still not technically considered menopause. Again, average age in the U.S. is 52 years old, but that doesn't mean that it can't happen at the age of 45, and it can't happen at the age of 57. So it depends on women, and also another way that, and it's, it's fairly genetically linked, so if you have if you yourself are starting to go have the symptoms early on in your early 40s or in your late 50s and you're wondering what's going on, if you look back at your mother and say, when did it occur with her? And she might be, it might be around the same time period, the same age. If she had dramatic symptoms, you potentially can have the dramatic symptoms as well. So what are the symptoms that are associated with menopause? Well, there's a whole lot of them. Um, but they are simple, they're, they're similar to those that we saw in the perimenopausal phase, except a little bit more dramatic. And what causes all these symptoms from, the, what pushes really all these symptoms is that drop in estrogen levels. So as estrogen levels begin to decrease in the body, we start seeing different things happening, a lot of the changes happening in the body. So the hair becomes thinner, um, it loses its luster, breast begins to flatten and, uh, and droop a little bit more, skin becomes looser, you start becoming, bone, bone mass becomes a little bit uh, diminished, and so what we see is we see this is the time that that one year after the last period is where we see the highest drop in bone density in women, and it's because there's, you don't have that estrogen effect on the bones that's really helping support the bones. And so usually that's when we start recommending the first bone density scan is usually around that time of the menopausal period, so, because that's when we know we're gonna lose the most bones. Um, we also, there's increased risk of cardiovascular, back aches, basically the whole body is changing 
completely from what it was before to what it is to be for the rest of the life. So this is something that now we go into the postmenopause period. So as you see, you have this, you know, you have no real changes, and then all of a sudden menopause hits, the body structure completely changes. And we see this all the time. We see pictures of, uh, you know, grandparents, and we say, wow, grandma, you were so beautiful when you were younger. <laughs> menopause happened. <laughs> and that goes, and then you have your 120-year-old grandma who's, who's completely lost all height, and that goes along with the whole bone density loss in, uh, that can happen. So, is there anything associated with the postmenopause periods? Well, this is where typically the symptoms start easing themselves. And the reason the symptoms start getting a little bit better is because, remember, as the, if you go from perimenopause to menopause, it's the hormone. Everything, everything when we talk about, well, especially in endocrinology, it's all about hormones. We're hormone specialists. We love our hormones. And so what's causing all of these symptoms is that drop in hormones, the estrogen levels, from this higher level that was before um, when you, while you're having ovulatory cycles down to when you become after your last period. And so there you have this significant drop in your, in your estrogen, and that's where the symptoms start coming about. But once they come down to very low levels, your body slowly begins to adapt to it. And it's that adapting process that starts minimizing all of a sudden the symptoms. So you're having symptoms because of this dramatic drop, and then as over time, while it flattens out, you kind of get better and better from it. Some people don't. You'll have some people who have these, these hot flashes that go on for years after their last period. They just seem to never go away. If you probably really think about it, how it was in the beginning to how it is maybe years later, it probably is a little bit better, but it's still not where you want to be. And that's that dramatic symptoms that we don't like and we really want it. Those are the things that we really want to treat. You don't want to suffer for the next 10 years just because you went to this menopause. And again, it can last just a few months. Uh, it, sometimes people don't even have any symptoms and it can last for years. And symptoms can continue to go on and on. What can be done about it? There's a lot of things out there that you can read about and you can see that that's related to um, treatments for the perimenopausal, menopausal type symptoms. So you got the natural supplements, um, you have the oral contraceptives, hormone replacement therapies, you got these creams, these gels, these injections. So a ton of things out there that, uh, that you can do, bioidenticals, and it's, it's pretty amazing how many things that are out there. Some of them work, some of them don't work at all. Some of them have risk, some of them don't have as much of a risk. And so it's very important to educate and know which one is the best ones for you. Um, the other thing that's important about this is that you want to be sure you're using it for the right reasons also. Some people like to just be on medications for the sake of being on medications, but that's always not the, the best way to treat. So what are the different treatments? We talked about some of these. These are getting a little bit more specific. We have the estrogens. They can be given alone or with progesterone. Um, the good thing about these, what the estrogen is doing is we, we're basically replacing that hormone that is no longer there. That's why it works so well. If you have, if the problem is lack of estrogen, you give it back and you're good to go. Now the problem is you, have, you do have some increased risk with the estrogen. Um, the reason I put end or progesterone is because the progesterone is typically given only if the woman has a uterus. If you do not have a uterus, you don't need the progesterone because of the risk of uterine cancer and ovarian cancer that uh, the risk all decreases by having, if you've had a hysterectomy, we don't worry as much about it. But estrogen is a good therapy and it can be given either as estrogen therapy itself or as oral contraceptive pills. People don't think about, you know, they, don't, they say, well, I don't want to get pregnant. Why do I got to be on birth control pills? But it's actually a good way to treat. I treat many of the women that come and see me with oral contraceptive pills, especially in the perimenopausal period, because it works well. It's low dose, something they've used when they're, you know, when they were younger, potentially, and, and it does its job. Antidepressants is another good medication that can be used. Now the problem with the antidepressants is people don't like to think about while well, I'm taking a medication for depression, people are gonna look at me funny because I'm taking that. 
First, I don't know why people are looking in your medicine cabinet, so they shouldn't know what you're taking. But the other thing is the antidepressants work really well, and a lot of people are afraid of taking hormones, and so they can take something like an antidepressant. It can really help minimize the effects, the side effects. And some of the side effects of the menopausal period is, you know, mood, depressed mood. You can get depressed from it. And so if you're on an antidepressant, it gets rid of some of those hot flashes, and it also gets rid of that bad mood that you've been having, those mood swings. It helps stabilize you. So it's a, it's a very nice um, medication, class of medications that we can use. The other one, the last one here is black cohosh. Um, I put that one down because a lot of people talk about this one, and they talk about, they swear by this being the medication that can help the menopause symptoms from happening and progressing. Now, that can be true, but studies have shown that it's not. So, um, because the reason I say it can be true is because you read up online, people swear by this stuff, and they say, oh, it, it does, my, all my symptoms disappeared. But we've done research on this, and we haven't been able to prove it at all. Um, it usually, the, the amount of, of beneficial effects from it doesn't seem to help. The other one that I have seen a lot of people use recently is soy products. So they talk about, you know, the bioidentical. Soybeans actually have, they are a form of what we call phytoestrogens. It's a type of estrogens that come from plants. And we do kind of, and I have seen very few patients who are really, they really dedicate themselves to, you know, the plant-based treatments. And so I've had one or two patients that have, that uh, can really eat a lot of tofu and soybeans and soy milk, everything soy. And if you can eat enough of it, it can work. It can do a good job, but you really got to eat a lot of this stuff. <laughs> but it's a good, it is a good way if you want to go. So that's why also sometimes we tell, we tell kids, you know, to try not to have too much soy products because if you're eating too much soy products, everything soy, 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 it can also push kids into going to maybe premature puberty or something because, you know, the estrogen, the, the, we don't want all that hormones to really be pushing through. So that's where we have the, the tre different treatments for um, menopause. Now let's kind of shift over to this andropause. Is it a myth? Is it real? Does it really exist? Um, what exactly is andropause? So what that is, and I'm using andropause, really we don't call it, we call it um, hypogonadism in the medical world, or low T, we hear a lot about low T. So low T, andropause, hypogonadism, these are all the similar kind of things, is basically low testosterone. And what it is, is the decrease in testosterone as, as males age. Now it's, it's a gradual, it's a much more gradual effect in men than it is to women. Now the true, if you were really going to, say andropause, you're basically comparing it to menopause, and menopause is, as we said, it's a dramatic drop in estrogen levels to close to zero. Andropause, by definition, should also be the same thing, where there's sudden drop in testosterone levels, and you would end up with the same symptoms of the hot flashes and everything that women get. We do have patients that this happens to. These are typically patients that are, have prostate cancer, and we try and block their testosterone production completely, and so we basically shut off the system, and that's, then you have this sudden drop in testosterone levels, and they can go into this quote-unquote andropause. So here we see a graph of kind of how it goes. There's a slight, slow decrease. It begins around the age of 40, 45. Um, doesn't have, it's not a very dramatic at 40, 45, but typically by the age of 70, you have a, fair, a fairly dramatic decrease in testosterone levels in the system. And what are the symptoms that go along with this? Well, it's very similar to what we see in the menopausal symptoms. We have, we have this loss of drive, this fatigue, this energy levels, this stanima, st stamina. Um, we see also in the bone marrows, testosterone is a nice booster of red blood cells. So you can have a decreased production of red blood cells. You have the hair uh, growth of the body hair, facial hair changes, muscle mass shifts, you become a little bit more obese, you get a little fatter, you, don't, you lose that muscle mass. Um, sperm production starts decreasing. 
so we talk about how you know elderly men, you know, 85 year old men can still father kids. Yes, that's true, but the spell, the amount of sperm that's there is much less than it was when they were you know 20 years old. So it's not as easy to do. So bone density also decreases, so they can become have that osteoporosis or that brittle bones that the women in postmenopausal period or menopause develop. It's not as dramatic, but it can happen. And so that's something that we also look at in men, but we're not, we're, we're more inclined to uh, look at the bone density of a woman in menopause than a, a man who's in his 60s, 70s, who's got lower testosterone levels. Unless there's other things that, other symptoms that's going on, if they're very thin, if they're frail looking, then they may also have the lower bone density along with the lower testosterone um, compared to uh, if they were heftier, kind of bigger. So when does it happen? Again, symptoms can start around 40, 45 years old, and it becomes much more dramatic after the age of 70. Um, the, uh, if you look at the pictures, you see also a big change in the body structure compared to how the, uh, similar to what the women go through, except it's a little bit more, it's less dramatic, um, it's less sudden, I mean, rather than dramatic. But you can have the muscle mass, as you can see, from, from left to right, you have much more fit, and slowly that abdominal, the stomach fat starts coming out. They get this little beer belly. If you look at the slouching going on in the back, that's going on what we call kyphosis. That could potentially could be occurring also besides the body structure changes. It could be the bone, the bone density is dropping, and so they're starting to slouch over, and you can develop this lower back pain, maybe even compression fractures. So it's something that is real, um, but it is, but it's got to be monitored very closely. Um, how, is, how is it treated? So we hear a lot about testosterone replacements. We got all kinds of formulations of that as well. We got the injections, we got the um, creams, we got the gels, we got pellets. There's a whole bunch of things that can, that can bring the testosterone, uh, actual testosterone that be given to the person. Exercise. Exercise is a key, key function um, to help naturally boost testosterone. People don't realize that this can actually be done, and I've seen this time and time and again in the more motivated patients who if you tell them, listen, you start exercising, you start trying to lose weight, you go out there, get into an exercise routine, doesn't have to be going back to the gym and, you know, knocking out weights like you're trying to become a Schwarzenegger or something, you, you know, you just got to go over there and, and start doing your thing. Cardio exercise, that's the main thing, you know, get the blood moving, get things going, and the testosterone will naturally start increasing. And it's impressive how much it can go up by. Of course, it's variable from person to person. Some people not as dramatic, but other people can really come back to normal. I saw a person today who, he was on testosterone treatment, but we stopped it um, for prostate reasons and his testosterone went from 150 up to 500. I know those are just random numbers for you guys, but that's a dramatic increase in testosterone levels. That's someone who was, we would have called hypogonadal or maybe andropause to someone who was completely normal. And that's just because of his exercise routine, getting out there, being physical, and doing what he had to do. He still feels a little bit tired, but majority of his energy is back. So that's another very important thing. Antidepressants also work well, not so much in boosting the testosterone levels, but the antidepressants will help more with the mood, depressed mood, the low moods that can come along with having the low testosterone. Benefits of testosterone. So besides the, so the body structure is the main one that most people are concerned about. You know, we gotta, we gotta we live in the islands. We, gotta, we need our beach bodies. So, so um, having that muscle mass, we perceive, you know, we want to have the big muscles there. Uh, bone density, it does help increase bone density, just as estrogen helps the women increase bone density. The testosterone can do the same as for men, and it's pro most likely because as the, as the testosterone, testosterone converts into estrogens, and that's what's really helping the bone, the bone health. Um, it's an improved sexual function, and that's another component that uh, is it's really very important in men. And so, the, so these are the three main key features that you get benefit from the testosterone therapy. So, this is again a kind of a uh, um, summary of the things that you can get from low testosterone versus testosterone repl once replaced. You have the fatigue, 
the memory issues depressed, you have increased body fat, erectile dysfunction, low libido, decreased bone mass, brittle bones, and then on the, on the right side or on the left side, we have someone there who's sharp, who's confident, who's happy. Now this is obviously a very, this is a very gimmicky type of thing. I don't want every male out here to say, I want my testosterone yesterday now because I want to be this guy running around, <laughs> confident, sharp-minded. You're not going to become an 18-year-old again. We'd like it to happen, but it's not going to happen. Um, yeah, and the plenty of energy, you go run a marathon. Yeah, that, that's, this is a very cartoonish of what happens. And it's also, that's also very important to understand also is because if you do not have true low testosterone, treating somebody without truly low testosterone doesn't really give any benefit. So if the testosterone levels, if you just have some symptoms, but the symptoms without the testosterone being low doesn't most likely means that it's not really, most likely not the testosterone that's low. So this is one of the things we see a lot of people out there in the community that they'll go and they'll treat anybody with testosterone. You come in, you're feeling a little bit off, you say, you know what, I'm a little bit tired, I need, I need test, I have low testosterone. They do some testing, testosterone levels may be in the normal range, maybe a little bit low, probably because it was done the wrong time of the day. But then they'll come and they'll give you these testosterone injections. You'll feel great for about a week or two, and then you'll notice that it doesn't really do anything. And that's because your body didn't really need it, and what you're doing is you're potentially causing more harm than good. So it's very important to understand that treatment isn't based just on what we think might make us feel better. It should be actually what will make us feel better. Um, what are the risks of being on testosterone therapy? So you can end up with enlarged breast tissue, gynecomastia, or this breast tissue is something, a common feature that we see. We typically see these in the bodybuilders who are injecting themselves with massive doses of, of testosterone, and it can cause this sudden breast, uh, breast enlargement. Risk of heart disease. This is something that's a little bit controversial, whether or not testosterone replacement therapy can truly cause heart disease. Um, there are some studies that say, yes, it does. Other studies say, no, it does not. So the, the jury's not really out yet on, on this one. Risk of prostate cancer. Now, it's a risk of prostate cancer. <clears throat> and the reason is because it does not cause prostate cancer. That's a very common misconception that testosterone causes prostate cancer. It does not do that. What it can do is if you, have, if you have cancer cells in the prostate, it causes those cancer cells to pretty much wake up and start proliferating. So if you have that predisposition for cancer, it may bring that cancer out to, uh, out to shine sooner than not. Um, increased risk of red blood cells. Remember, testosterone is a booster of red blood cells, and so by being on the testosterone, your blood cells can become, become much higher. So what is the risk of having more blood cells in the body? Well, that increases the risk of stroke and heart attacks. So you want to be careful, and you, you need to be very carefully monitored for both the prostate and the red blood cells, because the last thing you want to do is feel like that guy ready to run a marathon and then collapse because you had a stroke and heart attack because you had too much red blood cells in your body. So again, it's something to keep in mind. Testicular shrinkage. The reason the testicles get smaller and your fertility can decrease is because, you know, in males, testosterone comes from the testicles. If you're getting testosterone from the outside, the body, it's use it or lose it kind of uh, thing. If the testicles, if the brain sees that there's enough testosterone flowing in the body, the, body, the brain says, oh, we don't need to make anymore. We get plenty inside the system. So it, it turns off the signal to the testicles to make any more, uh, any more testosterone. So what does, that, what does that mean? That means that since the testicles aren't making anything else, the testicles say, well, we don't need to be here, and it starts shrinking down, and also that means lower sperm production. And you can, and you can see the guys, and I've definitely seen uh, males who have been on testosterone therapy for so long that they don't have testicles at all anymore. It's almost, it's completely disappeared. So it's, it's a real thing that the longer you're on it, and if, and if that can happen, that also, remember, that's where your fertility comes. So one of my big issues a lot of times with people being treated with testosterone therapy are the, young, are the young males. If you're 40 years old and you're planning on starting a family, 
and you're on testosterone therapy that can cause you become infertile, then how are you doing any justice to this guy? Yeah, he might feel good, and then he's going to want to go have kids, and then he cannot. And so there's, so it's, there's ways around that, but it's very important to understand the patient before you do it. Now, if someone's 75 years old and you're starting them on testosterone and you give them injections, well, do they really need a kid at 75 years old? That's, you know, so that's a whole different story. Um, <clears throat> so again, is it worth the testosterone treatment? Is it worth the treatment for menopause? This is a big question that we always, we, you know, we kind of ask ourselves all the time. The big thing, the big question is whether or not, as far as for the menopause goes, uh, when it comes to menopause, those symptoms are symptoms that we see so frequently, but it's not really spoken about. So I think there's a lot of women out there who undergo these hot flashes, these symptoms of depression, these mood swings. They don't really know what's going on. They think they know what's going on. They think it's the whole menopause thing. They go, ah, it's the menopause, nothing to worry about. Um, and at the same time, that's when things, that's when they should potentially be treated. Why suffer, your, why suffer for so long when you can be treated and you can keep those symptoms away? Same thing for the males. When it comes to males who are going through this low testosterone phase, if, it's, uh, if it becomes, if their symptoms are there, if their symptoms are bothering them, then absolutely, why shouldn't they be treated? Again, it should be done in the proper manner to avoid causing harm, but this should be done because we can really treat people and we can make them feel better. So if we can make, feel, make people feel better, then why not? Um, and especially if we can minimize the risks of everything. So that's the end of the talk. Thank you guys for your attention. Um, and if you guys have any questions? Yes, so raise oh. your hand and Dr. Parse, you can see. Oh, if exercise increases testosterone, does it do the same thing for estrogen for women? So when we're talking about the increase in testosterone, uh, so the question is about testosterone increasing in ec with exercise and estrogens increasing with exercise. Unfortunately, I do not think that the estrogen does increase with exercise. I think it's just the, the testosterone levels that we see that go up, unfortunately. Um, you know, I had a, a thyroid nodule a while back, and I've heard that it could lead to cancer. Um, what is the follow-up? It, it seems like the doctor wants to know, check some blood tests or whatever, but is there a routine you know, follow-up for thyroid nodules to check on it? You know, to, you know, what would you recommend? Um, so the question is about thyroid nodules, a little bit off topic, but still a very relevant topic. Um, thyroid nodules are very common in people. The older we get, the more common they are. We say about 80% of the general population by the time you're 80 years old has at least one nodule. And yes, the risk of the, the, the fear of nodules is thyroid cancer. And we do see a lot of thyroid cancer, and, is it, and the big question is, are we seeing a big upswing in thyroid cancer because we're diagnosing these nodules much sooner, we're, much more, we're monitoring them much closer, we're biopsying them a lot more. But in general, depending on the size of the nodule and what the nodule looks like under ultrasound, the follow-up can be once a year, once a year and a half, um, but we do like to follow them to make sure they're not growing and make sure no new ones come up. Because the big thing is, you know, a lot of people think, well, the bigger the nodule, then the higher the risk that that nodule is cancer. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. The smaller nodule can be the cancerous nodule. It's just a matter of how it looks under the ultrasound and whether the features, what are the features? Do they have that cancer look or does it not have the cancer look? Okay, we have a question there. Uh, thank you for sharing uh, this uh, very informative talk. Uh, if I, one is uh, showing the symptoms of uh, your testosterone levels being low, however, it tests normal, what, uh, what can be done to address those symptoms? Sorry, say that again. So th is the question that if your test is normal but you have symptoms of low t testosterone? Yeah, some of those that you... Well, the, well so there's different ways of measuring testosterone. You have total testosterone, we have free testosterone, bioavailable testosterone. Um, it has, the proper test needs to be done because sometimes one looks normal, the other one looks uh, low. So it has to be the proper test that needs to be done, number one. The second thing is if you have these symptoms and your testosterone is lower, a lot of times that's when I, and there's no, nothing else going on, um, medically going on, 
uh, one of the things that I like to push people is starting the exercise routine. That's where we see the exercise really making the biggest difference. That's where, you know, as you start, because uh, if you're making enough testosterone, it could be the fat cells in the body that are converting it to estrogen or converting it to other forms that it's not being used the way we would like it to be used. So that's where the exercise, cardio exercise is the key one. That's the one I always push people into. I don't want them to go lift heavy weights, just lean up. If you lean up, then that's where that self, that sense of well-being really starts coming back. Okay, question. Oh. What is considered oh. low testosterone? Is there a number? Or with age. Yeah, so it's in the, in the lab test. So the, the time to measure testosterone is first thing in the morning. And it's got to be a morning. Th so the testosterone works on what we call the circadian rhythm. What that is, it's, it's like a wave. It peaks up in the morning, drops down in the afternoon and the evening. And then just before we wake up, it, ki it kicks in again. And so that's what we want to do is we want to measure that peak effect. We want to see how high does it go. And... There, we do have different number cutoffs that we use. Um, I don't know if you want the, the cutoff values, but, you know, 250 to 300, that's, that's usually considered um, that lower limit. 300, I think, is the lower limit of the labs. 250 is considered low. Um, if, it's, if it's down in that lower range and you're having symptoms, it's worth, it's worth exploring it more. And, again, by exploring it, just by having low testosterone levels doesn't mean we've got to treat right away. We usually like to try measure it at least twice to really see and see what the average among the two are. Um, but we also want to see why is it low. Just low testosterone here, let's treat, that doesn't mean anything, but we want to see why. Is there, some, is there something going on in the testicles? Is there something going on in the brain that's turning off the cycle? You know, there's some people that come in with low testosterone, come find out they got a tumor in their brain that we got to worry about. And then you fix that and now everything comes back to normal. So it's, it's not just let's check, measure, see if it's low and just, and then treat it. it. It comes with a bunch of other things along with it as well. Okay, there's a question there. Uh, yeah, you mentioned about uh, natural supplements for women for their uh, estrogen. What about the natural supplements for men for testosterone, like those uh, testosterone uh, supplements that boost your, supposedly boost your testosterone levels? There's a whole bunch of things out there that are so when it comes to bioidentical hormones or hormones at GNC or GNC type products uh, or the vitamins that you see online and the problem with those is since they're not FDA regulated you really don't know what's inside them so if uh, an example of this is when I so you know I trained in in Los Angeles and one of the people that that I trained with was doing a study looking at uh, prenatal vitamins, so vitamins that women would take before they became pregnant. And we're looking specifically because, you know, endocrinologists, we're, you know, we like only endocrine-related stuff, so she was looking at iodine content inside these pills. Iodine is a very important uh, element for the thyroid development, and so you need to have enough of it so that the baby's thyroid develops normally also. So she went around and measured and all the difference, she went and bought from the store, bought a bunch of tablets, prenatal vitamin, and started measuring the iodine level in all of them and comparing it to what was marked on the bottle. It was amazing the difference between not even what was marked on the bottle and what was in the tablet, but even the difference between each tablet in the same bottle. So if it said there was, you know, you know how it says like, you know, 200% the daily recommended, if you measure the amount, some of them only had 5%. Some of them had 20%. Some of them had 600%. There is no, there is no consistency about it. So the problem with a lot of these hormones is we haven't really gotten to that level of being really stable with it. But there are, better, there are stuff that you can use to help increase um, over-the-counter type things for your testosterone. DHEA is probably the most, is probably the, the most common. DHEA is a hormone. It's a precursor hormone, so in the pathway of making testosterone in the body, DHEA is a couple steps before. And so by boosting that up, you're basically going to drive uh, testosterone levels to increase too. Um, other than that, those other testosterone boosters, testosterone from this root and that root, I don't really, not super familiar with them, and so I can't really say if those ones work or not. I'm sure some of them do, some of them don't. 
um, they're probably not very consistent. Even the DHEA, when you're getting over the counter, you're not really sure, you know, one tablet might have a lot more DHEA in it and really boost your testosterone levels more than another. But of the ones that I know, that would probably be the best supplemental vitamin. Thank you. Can I ask a question yeah. about the different uh, stages a woman goes through, peri and uh, menopause and then post. Um, can you give me just an idea how sexuality affects that, if they're very active sexually throughout those stages? Does that if decrease? If, if does that they are decrease the does it decrease? symptoms? If they are sexually active, does it decrease the symptoms? Um, I guess theoretically it can. So the problem with when they go into this uh, this perimenopause into the menopause and postmenopause period, that drop in estrogen levels can cause an atrophy and dryness of the vaginal area. And so I think it depends also as that level drops, it, it, can, it can really affect. Now, uh, the sexual activity, I think if a woman remains sexually active, I'm not sure, I don't think it's going to cause, have any effect on the estrogen levels. It shouldn't. Uh, but what it can do, it can because sexual activity is more of a, a hypothalamic, it's a brain function where there's, there's this increase of this hormone we call serotonin. And so the serotonin levels, which is a, for, is a type of uh, endorphin, so it's, it's, it's the happy hormone of the brain. And so you're going to have a better sense of well-being most likely uh, because you're having an increased uh, serotonin levels released in the brain. But I don't, it's, I don't think it's going to, it shouldn't in effect... Uh, affect the levels of um, the hot flashes and, and those because that's estrogen related and not necessarily serotonin. So you have some benefits of you feel better, um, but the overall symptoms, the hot flashes and the bones and all of that, does, that's not going to change. Yeah, somewhere along the line, I heard or read that women do produce a bit of testosterone and that they would be better off uh, having that replaced. Uh, in later years, and is that what progesterone is? What is that? No, so, yeah, so, so the question is about testosterone replacement. That's also something that we see a lot of women, uh, you know, the, the three hormones that a lot of women get started on um, in a lot of clinics is the testosterone, progesterone, estrogen. Now, progesterone is a hormone that, that women naturally produce premenopausally, um, with estrogen, and it's, it's a cycle that goes between pro uh, progesterone and estrogen to maintain the uterine lining. And, you know, so you, it maintains the uterine lining, and then it flushes out, and that's what your periods are, and so it's, it's this cycle that goes back and forth. Now, whether or not, so women, do women naturally produce testosterone? Because testosterone is part of the adrenal glands, the cycle um, it, to produce of what we call steroidogenesis, uh, um, testosterone is a, is a type of steroid uh, that yes there is testosterone that is produced in women um, there are testosterone that's also produced in women from the ovaries we see that in women who have polycystic ovary ovarian syndrome I don't know how familiar um, people are with that but that's where the ovaries uh, there's a little dysfunction with the ovaries and they become they start producing a lot of testosterone now when we get to the postmenopausal period whether or not um, that, I think, is a very controversial thing. We haven't really decided whether the, there is a true benefit of treating women with testosterone. Testosterone, uh, women who have been treated with testosterone can swear by it. Uh, there's a lot that swear by it. A lot of them that they don't really, is it really the testosterone? Is it the estrogens that's really helping them out? Um, I, at this point, have not been using testosterone treatments in women. I have on a few just because they really wanted it to use the testosterone. And so I've used it kind of to see how, how clinically if it would make a huge difference or not. I haven't seen much of a difference. It can cause, if you, if you think about the, the way testosterone works, it can cause some structural changes in the body. Um, so you get decreased amount of fat, increased lean muscle mass, which is what testosterone will do. The only problem with it also is that you can start what we call androgenizing a woman. So the woman starts developing those little, if it's not done properly, they start developing male features. So they start getting that male pattern baldness on the top of the head, the hair starts falling a little bit, um, the muscle starts becoming a little bit more overdeveloped, and so there's, there are some downsides to it. Uh, whether or not, yeah, so as far as the research goes, there isn't, as far as I know, there's, there's no real 
anything really leaning towards, yes, we should be treating women with testosterone. You have a question here? Parsa, would you recommend using vitamin D3 for menopause? So vitamin D has also been a big thing recently that it can cause, that uh, a lot of different associations, especially in endocrine literature and also in the, just in general. Um, there have been some associations with vitamin D and depression. And so you can replace, if you replace the vitamin D levels, it can give you a little, a little extra sense of well-being that, that we have seen. Um, but once it's replaced, continual treatment with vitamin D, I haven't seen any, any extra benefit out of it. Um, for some people who have been on the vitamin D, uh, if they are feeling great, and, they, and they're saying this vitamin D is like, you know, it's the best thing ever. I'm not going to say anything. I'm going to let them take it. It's vitamin D. It's very, you know, it's, it's, it's a placebo effect has wonderful, is a wonderful thing. So um, treating a woman postmenopausally with vitamin D specifically for postmenopausal symptoms, I don't think it really does much unless their vitamin D levels are low. Okay, more questions. I'd like to know how long um, you prescribe HRT for a patient. Can, can it go on indefinitely until they're 80 or 90 or 100? There, there are people who treat for that long. Um, whether or not it's best to treat someone for that long is a different story. We say that there is potentially increase of, of complications the older we get. I Me mean, personally, depending on how long the person's been on it, if they're on 10 years, 15 years, I'm okay with that. Uh, I some occasionally once uh, once we get to a certain point, it, I, I don't really use age as a marker, but I use more functional status of the person as as a marker. I'll start tapering the dose of estrogens down. Now the big thing is the reason they had those symptoms in the first place was because of a sudden drop in estrogen levels, and so the thing about getting them off of hormone replacement therapy is to remember, well, what was the reason, initial reason why they had the symptoms? So you need to slowly take them off the medication. And it can take years, it can take four or five years to get them off of it. You just slowly decrease it just by a little, decrease it just by a little, because you want to get that slow, gradual decrease, not to aggravate the symptoms and have the symptoms come back. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Anyone else? Good evening. Can you discuss the relationship between uh, testosterone levels and uh, anemia? Um, so testosterone is a fairly strong booster of bone marrows to produce red blood cells. Uh, so we do, we can see on occasion males who have uh, low testosterone and their red blood cells, can, they can be slightly anemic. Typically, that's not a very common thing to see. And the reason is because erythropoietin, which is the hormone that, that's produced predominantly by the kidneys that um, produces red blood cells, it's a whole different cycle that leads, that, that drives that system. Um, so, the, so we don't worry about anemia, low red blood cells, as much with, in those with low testosterone. What we do fear, though, is the testosterone, people who are on testosterone treatment, because now you're not letting the natural cycle do its thing and maintain the, red, the bone marrow, the red blood cells. Now you're driving this heavy testosterone levels into the system, and this is going directly par partially to the bones and driving the bones to start producing more red blood cells. And so you all of a sudden will have this, this polycythemia, we call it, or increase in red blood cells that, that, um, that we fear. And once it gets over a certain level, we do have patients that, you know, they feel, they feel great on the testosterone, their symptoms have completely gone away, but they have such thick red blood cells. And so sometimes we say, we'll just go to the blood bank and donate blood every so often so that you can, you know, get rid of all that that excess blood that you have in your system to maintain that safe level. Can 
you elaborate on the uh, risks versus benefit of the latest scientific evidence of HRT? And, you know, in my mother's generation, it was highly encouraged, and mine, it was discouraged, so. Yeah, so, so I mean, we encourage, the indications for hormone replacement therapy is fairly specific. Um, there's a lot of people who treat for maybe certain other reasons, but the main reason for, the indicated reasons for hormone replacement therapy is going to be the hot flashes, what we call the vasomotor symptoms, so those hot flashes. Um, there, is a, there was a big push for a while, the world, the um, WHO and some other organizations came that if you treat someone with estrogens, you can increase the risk of heart disease. The way now we are talking about is that, does that happen in males? And that kind of went back and forth for a number of years. And now we're kind of, we're seeing that, well, maybe it's not such a big deal. There is a slight increase in uterus ovarian cancer, and, uh, and typically that's with the estrogen progesterone combination therapy. And so that risk is minimized slightly by uh, if you've had a hysterectomy and so you don't use the progesterone, you just use the unopposed estrogens. And so there's um, the risk that we, so as far as risk benefit goes, I think the benefits of treating somebody is can outweigh the risk as long as the person has been properly evaluated. So if there's a strong history of, of breast cancer in the family, maybe not the best idea of being treated. Same thing for males with prostate. If there's a strong history of prostate cancer, maybe not the best idea to be treating with testosterone therapy. Um, so, or even uh, uterine or ovarian cancer. So it's, it depends, it's very individualized, but overall in general, it's a very good therapy and it really can help with the symptoms. And um, if we can keep women from feeling, going through these major changes and feeling miserable during that time, then it's definitely worth, I think is worth treating. Okay, and our last question. Is there any benefit uh, in women uh, in implementing HRT long after menopause or after menopause? Initiating it? Well, if you don't have the symptoms, typically, you know, that during that menopause or just post-menopause period is where the symptoms are the most dramatic. Um, there are people who will start maybe 10 years later, and it could be those patients could be those that those symptoms of the hot flashes just never went away. And so they're still having them, and they just finally they're just saying, I can't deal with this anymore, and they can start the, the therapy. Other times, women are starting the therapy just because. Um, there is some data that shows that if you start it 10 years after, after menopause, um, you are potentially increasing your risk, so it's better to start earlier. If someone's a smoker, it's an absolutely no no to start these estrogen hormone replacement therapies because you can increase, because one of the other things estrogen therapy can do, it can increase the risk of blood clotting. And so if you have, if, if you mix that with smoking, that risk dramatically increases. We do that also with women who are on oral contraceptive pills at the age of 30 or 35. We say if you're smoking, you're off these pills just because of that increased risk of stroke and heart disease, um, heart attacks. So it's possible that they can start it. It's where the evaluation comes in. I wouldn't start it just for the sake of starting it, though, at, at, um, if you, you know, 10, 15 years after menopause. Did she run away? <laughs> <laughs> Let, let's give Dr. Alan Farsa a round of applause. And um, I also want to say mahalo to our volunteers, um, Steve Takayama and Aimo Tran. Steve is also from the greatest school on the planet, uh, Mid-Pacific. Uh, Aimo, she's from Farrington, but go governors. <laughs> Uh, I want to let you know about our next month's lecture. It's going to be on stroke, uh, preventing stroke, um, simple ways to prevent stroke. We're going to have Dr. Kazuma Nakagawa. He's a neurointensivist, and he's with the Comprehensive Stroke Center. He's going to be talking about ways to prevent a stroke. Could you recognize the signs of a stroke? Also, the factors that can impact your risk for stroke, blood pressure, diet, routine exercise, stress, sleep apnea as well. That's coming up Wednesday, May 31st, uh, 6 to 7 p.m. That's free. You can call the Queen's referral line at 691-7117 or go online at queensmedicalcenter.org to register. And parking tickets, you can get them validated outside. 
uh, evaluation forms, if you can turn it in with the uh, volunteers. I want to thank you for coming this evening to our Queens Medical Center Speaking of Health lecture. Drive safe. Have a good evening. Good night. <laughs>